So thanks for this uh, enormous opportunity to share my uh, research with you. So I am uh, a new faculty. I still don't have a PhD student to make beautiful paintings, so I, uh, I had to go to Wikipedia and search for, uh, for a photo for you that can summarize how dramatic is adaptation, which is the main theme of my, uh, of my lab. And uh, in fact, uh, we are all, we can get amazed by the beauty, for example, of uh, butterfly wing or for uh, songs of birds. But uh, most of us forget how, uh, how such a beauty could be uh, generated by, usually by very severe struggle for existence. And the ethos of study of adaptation, it's really to understand what uh, are the factors which could uh, determine the survival under uh, harsh conditions. And here, for example, on this uh, painting, we, uh, we can really see uh, such a strong struggle about uh, how these shipwrecked mariners, for example, could survive uh, the harsh abiotic conditions, but also biotic because uh, the draft is so small and uh, it cannot uh, hold for everybody. So, um, one of the problems that, uh, one of the difficulties, in fact, in studying such uh, adaptation is that what are the selective fa uh, factors? The ecology is so uh, complex that in many cases we know, for example, that some uh, phenotype has been reproduced in different environments, but we cannot really re uh, recognize which environmental factors were responsible. The other problem is that also the, the development is very uh, complex that we cannot really identify in many times what determined the fittest? Who survived? Uh, who survived? Is it the fittest or just the luckiest who uh, happened to be on the, on the draft at the right moment? And I'm going to tell you about uh, two stories or two dramas. Uh, one is related to sexual selection or sexual reproduction, and the other one more about specialization on a toxic uh, resource. And uh, for the first, uh, for the first uh, uh, case, so. Um, in many insects, we know that there are, for example, uh, a dimorphism that, uh, so there are in a lot of animals, always are se sexual dimorphism, and we know that uh, such sexually dimorphic traits usually are among the most extravagant in uh, nature. But in some uh, animals, the dimorphism is restricted to one sex. And there are a lot of hypotheses usually when, uh, of this sexual mimicry, when you have only two morphs, one of them is, is potentially mimicking the other morph. So, uh, usually when this happens uh, in females, in the female sex, so we have this female, uh, for example, like, like the example of damselflies that I'm showing uh, you here. So you have, for example, males have always uh, a blue abdomen, whereas you have uh, two types of females, one which is, uh, looks like the male and the other one, uh, she, is, uh, she is different. And the hypothesis why this polymorphism has evolved in multiple species is that uh, it can be a defensive strategy within a sexual conflict uh, context. And, and uh, we know that mating in damselflies is very coercive. It's very, um, so male uh, would chase a female and they force uh, them uh, into mating uh, using, uh, by grasping their necks using their anal uh, plates. So you see here the poor girls, how they are, they mate in the two uh, photos. and. Uh, the idea and field observations uh, that have been accumulated is that females looking like males usually are less coerced by males. However, such uh, a ruse would only work if there are other uh, damselflies in the field which uh, are more attractive, uh, attractive uh, for the male. So we know in damselflies that this uh, has evolved in multiple species. We know that in, uh, in, uh, in most of the species, the trait is Mendelian, and, uh, but we don't know uh, what is the genetic basis uh, in such uh, almost non-model uh, organisms. So but for sure, there is no damselfly conference uh, as, uh, as far as I know. So, uh, so we are going to switch back to, to Drosophila. And uh, fortunately, the same trait has uh, already uh, evolved in one of the species of the Melanogaster subgroup. So it's closely related to uh, the Melanogaster, Drosophila Melanogaster. And uh, its name is Drosophila erecta. So uh, already the name is suggestive a little bit about what it's uh, what this species has, and we can, you can see here, for example, uh, the, the two female morphs. And it has been known since the 80s that the, there is only a single locus on the X chromosome controlling this dimorphism, restricted only to the females, and uh, the dark allele uh, is dominant. 
So we benefited for, from this knowledge and we started uh, an introgression mapping uh, experiment. So introgressing the domain, uh, dominant uh, dark allele into the uh, light recessive background and for multiple generations and then multiple back crosses and then uh, sequencing the back uh, uh, dark uh, flies in a pool, compare them with the dark uh, parental uh, uh, earlier. And as you can see, the, uh, we confirmed that there is only a single locus on the X chromosome. The locus, for example, here I am showing you in the inlet 1 megabase, uh, centering on uh, one of the usual suspects in melanin senses genes, which is the gene 10. So uh, to look, to have a further uh, sight about what is happening within this inlet, so we started to look only to the two parental lines, and we started to see, uh, to, to check, for example, what uh, what how much divergence is distributed throughout this uh, one of this QTL, and we were struck in fact to find uh, has a high divergence divergence DNA divergence uh, only in, in the center, but at eight percent eight percent is very high in fact to, fi to find uh, within species variation, and uh, we, we were uh, we were happy to find that this uh, very high divergence was restricted to uh, an enhancer of the melanin senses gene called the TMSE, or uh, male-specific enhancer. So in Megastor, this part, this enhancer is uh, supposed, or was shown that it contributes to make the, the sexual dimorphism why uh, male abdomen is darker than the, uh, the light female abdomen. And then we started to say, so there is a whole hypothesis about balancing selection in nature in damselflies, could we find uh, a signal of balancing selection? We know from population genetic theory that there are some expectations that we could uh, find them uh, on the types uh, of molecular polymorphism. And we had access from in the Museum of, uh, of Paris uh, to 40 males. So males are all dark, so we do not see what uh, polymorphisms they have and from two African uh, populations, from Cameroon and Gabon. So we sequenced this enhancer in this um, in these uh, populations, and we found that uh, the enhancers from natural, the natural enhancers formed two uh, haplogroups, two, uh, two groups wh which clustered with the haplotypes from the dark and the light uh, females. The second thing, which will, will uh, and also something among the expectations from balancing selection, that the two haplogroups would form if just we cluster the frequency that they have, they are in both populations at intermediate uh, frequencies. But what uh, really attracted us the most it was to compare the the distance of between the haplogroup, the polymorphism within the species with uh, the distance to their closest relative, which is uh, Drosophila arena. And uh, to find that Drosophila arena uh, do not branch in the middle of this distance, which means that it's closer to one of the two haplotypes than the other. This is what, uh, yeah. And such a pattern where you can really have uh, as big uh, a polymorphism, as large a polymorphism as the divergence, was restricted to only this uh, region if you compare to the whole, uh, here I think it's uh, one megabase maybe, uh, yes, a window. So we compared, for example, between the dark, uh, so what you see here in the graph, so in blue is polymorphism, and uh, then you have the uh, comparison between either the dark haplotype, the dark genome, uh, and the uh, arena, or the light genome and arena. So, we try to look a better, to have a better uh, view about the polymorphism itself uh, in nature and arena, and we found that uh, indeed in the most conserved part of the TMSE region, you will find that arena. Uh, so yes, I'm sure, yes, it's also here. Yeah, it's difficult to, to point from there. So, uh, so in fact, so arena has almost exactly the same kind of uh, of uh, alleles that uh, are found in the dark uh, the dark morph, the dark haplotype. Except there was an, a unique insertion that's not is not found in any other species of the Melanogaster subgroup of 50 base pair, pairs in the middle of the uh, enhancer region. And what is more surprising is that Orena females are light. So if, for example, okay, we find that Orena females look like the light females, this would have, would have been expected. But to look to find that a light female looking like a dark haplotype. This was not very, um, 
expected. And so we postulate the hypothesis that maybe the, or this data even suggested more that there was an ancestral polymorphism. That means that this kind of color dimorphism was present in the ancestor of both species, Erecta and uh, Orena. Then Orena lost this dimorphism and uh, it lost it by that, that the dark uh, allele uh, mutated and became uh, unable to express tan in uh, the cuticle. And this was reconfirmed later by, uh, so we confirmed this by GFP uh, transgenesis. So all the strains, whether for example saplotype from the light morph of, uh, of Erecta or uh, it's a dominant morph or the one from Orena, all express uh, tan in the, in the male. So, uh, this confirms the, the transgenesis. But if you look to the level of expression of the GFP between Orena, which is light, and the erecta light, you will find that like, if there is still some traces of a dark expression in, uh, uh, in the Orena uh, abdomen of the female. So what could drive such uh, polymorphism? Would we expect, for example, a similar mechanism like the ones that, uh, that have been suggested for the damselflies? So in a previous postdoc with Virginia Orgogozo, uh, we looked at uh, mating uh, anatomy in different uh, species of Drosophila, and uh, in Erecta, they were really unique by having uh, the male phallus of the male uh, penis is extremely uh, large, containing uh, many spines that you, you may see, see them. I guess this is very unique uh, among the nine species of the subgroup uh, of Melogaster. And we also discovered that in the female, uh, such spines in the female uh, ovipositor, uh, they are, or the uterus, they have this very unique uh, sclerite, which here you can uh, see it when the female the ovipositor exclude, uh, extrude, uh, is extruded for egg laying. So they seem, there is a debate in evolutionary biology when you find such spines, would the female like the spines or they, do, or they are harmful to the female? It's difficult to, to know what the female Drosophila think about them, but the, their shape suggests more or less that something uh, more, uh, more harmful, and also the shape of a defensive uh, sclerite would suggest that uh, this trait, this copulation in erecta may be uh, quite uh, coercive too. And we may suggest, and I'm suggesting this paper, is that maybe like in the well-documented cases in damselflies, also in Drosophila erecta, uh, this female limited dimorphism has evolved as a second layer of uh, defense against uh, uh, non-wanted uh, copulations. And uh, this conclusion has inspired uh, a poet, so he wrote uh, a Shakespearean uh, in England. He wrote a Shakespearean sonnet uh, based on this uh, Drosophila erecta study. So, and I really recommend you to, to read, uh, to, to go to the site and to listen because also it's, uh, it's audio to, to the poem, but do not uh, retain, uh, so uh, retain the name of the poet because if you just uh, you Google the title, uh, Rough in Love, you are not going to find poetry as if your first uh, Google hit. So, uh, so this at least was a story about Erecta. And now, really to, to, to be more uh, confident about uh, uh, any results, we need to have more replicates. And in evolution, uh, the closest thing to a natural replicate are this uh, convergent uh, evolution. So the same kind of female limited color dimorphism uh, has evolved in uh, multiple species of another group of species, another clade called the Monsium group. So uh, you can see here on this phylogeny, we map in the sm with the small uh, red uh, circles, we map all the cases where uh, females uh, have also two Mendelian morphs. And uh, in small here in blue are uh, three species that we, uh, that we looked at. Uh, we tried exactly to send the same uh, back cross uh, technique to identify which gene, but we did not find a locus on the X. We find in three species the same uh, locus to be associated with the dimorphism, but it was on the uh, an autosomal arm uh, 2R. And uh, this uh, locus centered on uh, a uh, transcription factor called PDM3 that we know in Melogaster that it affects pigmentation, but in, in both sexes. And independently or convergently, another uh, as story is convergent evolution, so uh, independently uh, also the, uh, in a fourth species, 
uh, Artyom Kopp and Emily Delaney were working on uh, to map it using a huge uh, line, uh, number, a large number of lines for GWAS, and they found only two uh, SNPs to be associated with the trait in the middle of the same uh, locus uh, and in the intron of the PDM3 uh, gene. And these two uh, mutations that are here in, uh, depicted in red and, uh, and uh, blue so flanks, uh, flank uh, a structural variant. So there is a structural variant associated with this trait. And uh, we still we don't know exactly does this uh, structural variant uh, regulate PDM3 or uh, something else, but they are not present in any of the other three species. So to summarize, if uh, this, this trait has evolved in multiple species, Sometimes we find two different genes. When we find the same genes, we do not find the same mutations. And also, we try to understand, OK, why, uh, why this has evolved a lot in the Monsium uh, clade. So when we look to the penis in Monsium, we do not really feel any harm uh, about them. They, are, they do not uh, have this such spiny uh, traits like erector. So would the fact that we do not find the same gene, for example, maybe the, they have uh, this polymorphism may have another function, or maybe simply it, it would be neutral without any uh, direct effect on the fitness? We cannot at the moment uh, answer this question. And this will take me to the second question, in fact, where we can, we can uh, have more complex system is that of speciation. And speciation in Drosophila is usually or often equated with re reproductive isolation, but Reproductive isolation is not the whole story. It's for sure is a very important factor to limit or to reduce gene flow between uh, divergent populations, but other factors as well uh, can reinforce uh, or even sometimes drive the evolution of reproductive isolation. And uh, one of these factors are, for example, adaptation to different uh, niches. And we, we call this ecological speciation. And again, one of the best models to study ecological speciation when it is repeated. So for example, we have like in the stickleback uh, example where uh, in different oceans, you have always a, a big, big uh, fishes like this with uh, good armor. But in the different oceans, every time they are going to colonize fresh water, they will evolve exactly the same uh, phenotype. And uh, another example, for example, is the, the stick insects, uh, which uh, also in different populations in North America, when they uh, are associated with the same two different plants, they will evolve the same uh, set of uh, characters and also uh, a degree of reproductive isolation. But in these two examples, we cannot really rule out the hypothesis that maybe the fact that similar phenotypes appear, it's, they are not uh, what we call hemiplasis, not homoplasis, in the fact that they may be the same uh, allele or the same mutations, for example, migrating uh, through gene flow, because we are studying uh, within the same species. So we have conducted, uh, not in this purpose, we have really conducted for simple systematic uh, purpose a lot of uh, several uh, field trips in Madagascar in the surrounding uh, islands to just to understand the diversity and the ecology of uh, Drosophilids there. And uh, one of the trips, for example, we had to, to use uh, uh, a ship to, uh, to visit some un uninhabited islands and uh, to, to land on the island, you should take a helicopter to go there. And I can tell you that all these fancy strips yielded really nothing uh, very interesting. But the only, the only uh, good results that appear from, from these uh, trips, first of all, I wasn't among them. So already this was a factor. And the second factor, in fact, that it was in Mayotte in 2013. So my colleagues went uh, without me. And Mayotte is an overseas French territory. It's highly accessible. It's very, uh, it's, uh, so you have very good uh, conditions for, to, to conduct uh, lab work and field work. And it, uh, it has been prospected uh, for maybe 30 or 40 years. And what my colleagues found, in fact, that when they took their day off, when they went to, uh, to the beach, not like the researchers working in Hawaii who do, who do not go to the beach there. So when they went to the beach, they found a, uh, a morenda tree. And morenda is. Uh, is a, is a tree uh, yielding this kind of fruit, and the fruit is uh, and the fruit is uh, uh, toxic to the majority of insects. And we are we know only a single case in insects to be specializing on this fruit, which is Drosophila sechelia, which also closely related to uh, Melanogaster. 
So what my colleagues found, they found a species, some flies from a species which is very common everywhere in Africa, and even in Madagascar. It's very easily collected using the standard method with banana traps. And maybe this is why in, in my yacht, because this is usually the standard method, it has never been uh, observed there in my yacht before. When they looked to the fruits uh, falling on the, on the land, uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the beach, and finding which fly, they found a population of fly hovering over it, over it, they brought it back, and then they found that all, this all, all these flies belong to this uh, general species. They set banana traps everywhere, never uh, the flies went, visited the, the trap. And it was only restricted to this uh, region. Uh, we went back last year we, and prospected the whole uh, island and still uh, uh, the whole or the most of Africa. All the beaches on the island, and I can tell you that it's never a banana, uh, any, any single Yakuba uh, went to, uh, to a banana trap. So here we have a very interesting model because any similarity in adaptation to Morenda between Seychelles and Yakuba, it cannot be attributed to introgression. These two flies, they are uh, very dist uh, relatively distantly related. They are geographically and genetically isolated. So we have really a model of parallel speciation where uh, gene flow can uh, at least be uh, ruled out. And the researchers for 30 years who worked mostly on the Seychelles and Simulans were trying to ask to reconstruct how a host shift can take place. How from an ancestral generalist uh, breeding site, so for example, usually most generalist species like Melogaster would breed even in Morenda when it's rotten. When it's rotten, the toxins are degraded and the fruit is populated by different uh, generalist species. So only Seychelles was able to evolve a higher preference and a higher performance to uh, the fruit, but also to the toxins, to the chemical toxin uh, of this fruit, which is octanoic acid and hexanoic acid. And the big question was how this, all these uh, phenotypes, which we can classify them in these two broad categories, should simultaneously evolve. What was the pace? What was the, uh, the pace? that uh, such uh, simultaneous adaptation, multifactorial adaptation, took place. And we know, for example, from the studies uh, of hybrids between Seychelles and Simulans, is that usually uh, an olfactory attraction, for example, to choose between Morenda or banana is usually intermediate uh, and inferior type, whereas uh, in the F1, they are more tolerant to the, to the toxin. So the researchers have uh, hypothesized they may be uh, olfaction uh, evolved by a loss of function mutations, Whereas, uh, to gain the resistance to, uh, to the fruit, you need to, uh, to have more gain of function in, the, in, your, uh, in the genes. So we made exactly the same uh, kind of experiments uh, on our Ayakuba flies, and we found a uh, similar pattern, where indeed dominance was uh, dominant, uh, so, sorry, performance or survival of Noni was uh, dominant, and uh, attraction was intermediate. And we started to look at the genome to search which part of the genome could distinct these specialist Drosophila populations from mainland generalist uh, populations. And we found, in fact, uh, only that, that only few uh, genomic regions uh, show some signals of uh, what we could call a hard selective sweep or a very strong differentiation in uh, uh, highly recombining uh, genomic regions. Uh, was for, for, so here in gray, you're seeing the centromeres and telomeres, and as you can see, there are some of the some of the peaks are usually most of the big peaks are in the lower combining region, and some of them uh, harbor some uh, candidate uh, possible gene uh, to be involved in plant uh, insect interactions. So taking this uh, setting, for example, a certain threshold. Uh, Say this in any gene, any uh, window or any gene uh, falling above this threshold would consider to be uh, highly differentiating. And we ask the question okay, how many of these highly differentiating regions would fall within the QTL uh, that we know between Seychelles and uh, Silvus? And we found, for example, that for uh, studies that identified QTLs for larval tolerance, we have uh, a very uh, 
a very uh, non significant uh, very significant uh, overlap that uh, that cannot be explained by chance between for example one of our uh, very highly differentiating regions, which contain a juvenile hormone receptor, if a common target in the insect uh, plant uh, interactions. And for example, for another uh, locus, which is called uh, Osiris, it, uh, we also, there was a study uh, finding it as a QTL for adult resistance in between Seychelles and Simulans. And within this QTL, so this QTL was the whole region, we find that only uh, a single uh, window uh, between two Osiris genes showing the highest uh, differentiation. And again, this cannot be obtained uh, by, by mutation tests. We found that this wouldn't be uh, possible to be obtained by, uh, by chance alone. But what was very surprising that in spite of the very big difference in olfactory attraction uh, between uh, Mayot and the mainland, we did not find any overlap between highly differentiating regions and the QTLs that have been identified for this uh, behavior. Put here my talk. Uh, so I just uh, show you the two uh, stories. In each, in fact, it was always very difficult to obtain the exact selective pressure and also to predict the exact uh, genetic response uh, that uh, that uh, responded to, the, to such pressure. And I would like to thank uh, the people who worked on this uh, project with me on, on, this, on the two stories and those who worked on, on different part of it. Thank you a lot.